Do you find that your startup produces more anxiety than revenue? Does your morning routine consist of running down an endless list of worries? Do you lie awake at night and regret ever starting your business? Today on the Startup Therapy Podcast, we're going to explore why anxiety is a part of every founder's life and how we can actually harness it as a superpower. This is Ryan Rutan from Startups.com, back for another episode of the Startup Therapy Podcast, here with my co-host and partner, Will Schroeder. I remember a time when this topic was particularly germane to you. Maybe <laughs> more maybe more germane to Elliot and I, who had to load you into a car because we thought you were having a heart attack and drive you to the nearest minute clinic. Oh, I'm not sure why we didn't take you to a proper hospital. <laughs> We do, we do love you. <laughs> we didn't think, we, I don't know what was going on. I mean, wow, that was, what was that, like six years ago? Yeah. I remember this. I remember we're at lunch, uh, me, you, Elliot, and whomever else we were at lunch with, and I remember just feeling really weird. And, and just something like just about my body just felt really awkward. And I remember saying to you guys, like, hey guys, I just don't feel right. And I, I couldn't figure out what was going on. I was and, pretty sure I knew. I was pretty <laughs> sure it was the giant plate of chicken parm that you had eaten at lunchtime. And I thought, you're just going into a food coma, man. Yeah, just no, that just made me delicious, it. right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, oh man, I, I remember getting in my car and driving home and I was on the highway and I remember calling my wife and I was like, I, something's really wrong. I can't figure out what's happening to me. And just as I was saying that to her, I'm on the phone, I'm on speakerphone with her. All of a sudden, I feel my entire pulse and my heart rate just stop. And I'm on the highway, right, in my car trying to get home to try to figure out what the hell's going on. And your heart doesn't need to stop for very long <laughs> for you to kind of notice <laughs> yeah. it's not working. And all I remember, uh, I was able to keep control of the car somehow. All I remember is saying to her, I don't feel right. And then just things going black for a fraction of a second. And then just my whole body, like the whole life force just drains out of me. And I was terrified. I had no idea what was happening. Uh, I was all woozy. I was only about a minute from my house. So remember, Ryan, if you remember, I got to my house and I remember calling you guys from the floor of my living room saying, like, I said, you guys <laughs> need yeah. someone to come pick me up. Come like, save me. Yeah. ASAP. You remember when you guys got there? I didn't look very healthy. No. You uh, you looked like a fairly bad wax figurine of yourself. It was crazy. And again, yeah. up until this point, I have no idea what's going on. This is the first year where we're launching the company, and I'm terrified. So for some reason, we thought the smartest thing to do would be take me to a minute clinic around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> we get there, and the lady's running the, the test, and she's like, you need to be in the ER like right now. <laughs> like You are in really bad shape. Elliot and I were in the uh, the waiting room getting flu shots. We're like, hey, while well, we're here. <laughs> we were the worst people to, to, to diagnose this at all. And so I get ferried to the hospital. I'm in ICU. And apparently what had happened was that I had a severe anxiety attack, which has many of the same symptoms and feelings as a heart attack because your body just pretty much shuts down. And I didn't even really know I had anxiety. Right. Like, I didn't know that was a thing. Right. And oh man, I remember sitting in the hospital room for almost two days because they were trying to figure out what was wrong with me. And, you know, I'm only 37 at the time. So they take this stuff pretty seriously. And I remember my wife's there and my newborn daughter's there. And I'm like, what the hell, man? I'm too young to have a heart attack. And it, it turns right. out I was I actually had a pretty healthy heart. But the doctor, I'll never forget this, right? The doctor comes in and he said, look, there's a lot of things that tend to create the onset of this type of problem. He said, here's a list of life events. Any one of them. <laughs> you see where this yeah. is going? Just straight Any line down through the checkbox. Oh, man. He's like, you know, death in the family, uh, change of job, change of location, starting a family, getting married, getting... And I'd literally done all of them all in the course of like nine months, right? Yeah. And every single time one of these giant new things happened, I was just like, Added it to my checklist. Okay, get, you know, getting married, good, checklist, right? Having kid, good, checklist. Starting company, good. I mean, 
I just compartmentalized all of it because that's yeah. kind of what founders do. Yep. You didn't realize you were literally making an omelet of anxiety for yourself. Like, Holy just get cow. It all in at once. Holy cow. And so my body just went supernova immediately, totally without warning. Didn't see it coming. And the doctor comes back to me and he says, Look, man, like you can't just take anxiety off the table, right? You can't negotiate with anxiety. And for what you do, you know, I've been a startup founder now for 25 years. It's the only job I've really ever had. I have become the ninja master at compartmentalizing startup anxiety, right? <laughs> like every time <laughs> yeah. something comes up, I just kind of like forget about it, you know, ignore it, what have you. And at the time, what would have been almost 20 years of compressing that anxiety turned into me, you know, staring at the lights in the ICU. It was yeah. fucking brutal. You finally hit critical mass. I hit critical mass. Very critical mass. But here's the worst part, or the funniest part, depending on how you look, depending on your sense of humor about these things. What I ended up doing at that point, right after I got out of ICU, I remember talking to you and Elliot and, and talking to, you know, um, all of my founder friends, particularly my founder friends, and I said, hey guys, you know, I just went through this crazy experience where my whole body shut down and I'm dealing with this thing called anxiety that I've never understood before or had before. And every single one of them were like, oh, yeah, I dealt with that before. Oh, you were in the ICU. I was in the ICU, yeah. too. I'm like, how the hell has this never come up <laughs> right? Right. the entire time that we've been building as founders? Like, I've known you guys for decades. How has this not come up? How is this not like in all of our conversations? And it was just mind blowing. Yeah, this is not uncommon at all in our space, right? We're all dealing with this. The, the interesting fact is that we've all decided not to talk about it. And I think there's a lot of reasons and we can dig into to a bunch of those. But it is a ubiquitous condition uh, amongst the founder community. Um, and, and with good reason. We do have plenty that we can worry about. <laughs> so yeah. like, there's a everything. lot going on, right? Everything's Literally, broken everything by default, is, right? <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. We're, we're slowly putting it all back together, uh, hopefully. Right. And, and so, yeah, we've, we've all been through these things. You know, we talk about a lot of these common experiences, you know, staring at the ceiling at four o'clock in the morning, not just questioning your business, but your entire existence. Right? Absolutely. Like, I am so good at beating myself up at like three o'clock in the morning, just laying there staring at the sky uh, and and just thinking about every mistake I've possibly ever made that has led me to this moment, right? And right. For some reason, like, and, and you know, once you once you put a name to it, and I think that was something interesting. You know, you said I had never dealt with it before. And certainly, you were suffering from anxiety prior to this, one hundred percent. But until somebody put a name to it, you didn't have a way to describe it. You didn't have a way to understand it. You didn't have a framework for it, right? And so I think that, uh, that that's a huge piece of it is just having a way, you know, having a vernacular to describe it and be able to talk about it. The bigger step is then actually talking about it with other people. But it is certainly an omnipresent condition amongst the founder community. And I don't think we're rewarded for talking about it, right? I mean, who wants to hear that that the CEO of your company is a bundle of anxiety that's just about to head to the ICU. <laughs> right? Right. It's like not exactly something you want to bring up at the company meeting or at your next investor yeah. pitch. Right? right. Yeah. You don't want to show that, right? Like, okay, here's our, here's, here's our, our current financial performance chart. Um, here's, uh, here's the founder's EKG, right? Right. It's right. not something that you want to be part of all that. No, exactly. And so what threw me off was I was conditioned and this is self-imposed, but I can't imagine I'm the only one. I was conditioned to believe that the reward structure comes in from talking about the things that anxiety doesn't do you, right? I'm fearless. I'm capable, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing slows me down. I'm, I'm rewarded for those sentiments. Yep. I'm not, there's, there's no reward structure for saying, I'm kind of fucked up. Right? I mean, yeah. So, but actually, you you, that there thing. is, right? There, yeah. there, is a, there is a reward structure there, actually. It's probably far more important. The other one is really about ego. Um, right. and, and the second is, is really about you know, self-care and, and health. And so there, there is a, a reward structure there. It may not be obvious um, and, and it may not feel amazing at the time, but the alternative is uh, be, being shoved headlong into. Do you remember when we loaded you into the car? I don't. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> it was that alone, like I wish we had a video of that. That would that would be the case point and sale for, you know, making sure that you don't take it to that level because we literally had to just kind of like chuck you across the back seat of the car. But, but you know, it opened my eyes and it opened the dialogue, which I think is healthy. Yeah. It was the, the impetus for, for why, why I wrote that, that article about how I yep. deal with my insane startup anxiety. Number one was realizing that I even had it. Yeah. Number two 
was talking to my friends, and you know, most of my friends are founders, and finding out every single one of them yeah. had the same issue. Yep. Right. And yet it had never come up in, up until that point. I had nothing but founder conversations for two decades, day and night. And yet this particular topic had never reared its head. It just seems damn near impossible. Right. But I thought it's why it's important for us to talk about, you know, so we can kind it of yeah. not only talk about the fact that it's present, I think everyone listening is just going to shake their heads and go, yeah, of course. Right? Yes, yes, um, yes. But what to do about it, right? Right. Because, you know, that's the big part. One of one of the most important things that came out of that particular episode for me was that I began to start to watch for it, right, in other people. Oh, good and point. say like, hey, right? Now that, you know, it's not just about talking about my own anxiety, which is also important, but now you can start to see the signs, right? And and you can you can start to try to be helpful. You know, you can ask the questions. And I think that's something else that, you know, you may find, and if you've got other founder friends, ask them about these things, right? It's fine to say, hey, be brave and talk about them. But you should also be brave enough to ask your friends. Like if you see signs that somebody is really struggling or seems really worried, and guess what? If they're if their if they're title somewhere, the CEO or founder, uh, yeah. you probably feel pretty safe in asking Given. the question. Yeah. yeah, they're going to have it. And I think that's an important piece of it too. Is that that we you know that because we can become aware of it. And, and you know, I was aware that I had anxiety. I was pretty sure that I knew other people that were you know suffering from this to some degree. But until that particular episode of, of you know, shoving you into the car, I didn't realize how acute the impact could be and, and how serious the consequences could be. And so for me, and hopefully now just by proxy for everybody listening, there'll be some understanding about how important it is to get this out on the table and to watch for those signs and, and to be ready to help. Yeah. I mean, look, there's, there's no version of what we do that has certainty. Right. So yep. the very definition of what we do is running into the abyss, creating things that never existed is based in anxiety. Right? Yeah. I mean, anxiety <laughs> is the fundamental of it. Right. <laughs> yep. If, if you're not anxious about what you're doing, you're lying about it. Right? I mean, it's just exactly. kind of that simple. And, and you should be anxious about it right now. Now, should be anxious and there's no way to deal with it or you have to be overwhelmed by it. And it's the same thing. Exactly. Right. And so a lot of what we've talked about over the years is basically how we unpack anxiety, how we certainly talk about it, but how we just deal with it, right? Yeah. And make it you know, more of a, a superpower than a this, this crippling part of our lives. And, and exactly. a lot of what I think we should talk about today is kind of what some of those techniques are. Because I, I think for both of us, it's, it's changed our lives dramatically. And I think for a lot of folks that are listening, uh, it could have a lot of impact. All right. So let's, let's dive in and, and let's start to talk about a little bit how we, how we unpack this and how we handle it. In an article that you wrote a couple of years ago, we broke it out into kind of four four different areas, four different steps. Uh, so let's just let's just dive in. And and you started by saying like, let's detail the consequences. Let's really talk about what actually happens should any or all of these you know horrendous fears uh, that are driving the anxiety come to fruition. Right. And I, I think what, what happens is, and certainly what happened to me is we think about what the worst possible case is and just make that the definitive answer. Right. Or yeah. even worse, we create this amorphous problem, right? Something bad will happen if this startup doesn't work or if this product doesn't launch or if we don't raise yeah. money, but we never give it detail. And when it lacks detail, it, it lacks resolution. Right. Yeah. So I can't fix a problem that has no detail. And by way of that, I'm stuck in kind of this, this startup anxiety mode forever. Right. For sure. You got to quantify it and you got to qualify it. Exactly. Exactly. And so I remember having done this uh, inadvertently when I was in my, my early 20s, you know, starting my first company. And I had raised uh, about $100,000 worth of debt. When I say raised, I don't mean I went to professional investors. I mean, I took out credit cards in college <laughs> yep. and, and, and they kept uh, racking up debt. I raised now, around. Who's in, who's in your cap table? Uh, Visa, MasterCard, Amex <laughs> denied me, but uh, they they did look at the deal. They, literally, Am yeah. literally anybody who would uh, who would give me money. But but I remember sitting in bed and, and I'm about a hundred thousand dollars in personal debt, and and I was again twenty one maybe. And there's no possible way I was ever going to pay this money back, right? So I remember that moment of, of laying in bed, staring at the ceiling. I can picture it in my head right now, thinking to myself, "How the f am I going to?" ever pay this back, right? <laughs> I mean, like, like, yep. like what happened? But then I said, wait a minute. Let me look at it from the, the other uh, standpoint. What will actually happen when I don't pay this back, yep. right? As I started to unpack that, I realized that, yes, I'm going to have to file for bankruptcy. Terrible. I'm 21. That limits a whole bunch of opportunities, being the fact that I'm only 21 years old. 
Number two, I can go get a job anywhere right now and make, this is given the time period, like 10 bucks an hour. And that's going to be more money than I need to pay my bills. Ergo, yep. I'm going to not, uh, I'm going to be safe. I'm not going to stop eating. I'm not going to have, uh, I'm not going to lose the, the shelter over my head. At its fundamental level, I think all of us in unpacking and detailing our, our anxiety need to understand that the consequences come down to, am I safe, right? The moment you can say that I will be safe, and safe can have a lot of different contexts in my relationship and my finances, et cetera, then all of a sudden you come from a place of strength. But the moment that you don't define safety and whether or not you can get to it, you just, you fall into the trap. Yeah. Right. And, and, you, and yeah. you can't battle. You, it. you feel like it's an abyss, right? You, there's no end to it. I'll just keep falling forever. And and the reality is most of us have a better safety net than that. We may never have tested it, but, you know, particularly in, in the United States, you can sort of only fall so far, right? And then there are all exactly. sorts of things that are going to catch you. And and I'd argue that, you know, particularly at the age of 21, your ass wasn't that far from the ground in the first place, right? You weren't going to fall very far. You didn't have much to lose at that point. You, you know, I, I agree with that in retrospect, but but I thought about this a lot, especially at the time. It didn't feel like that at the time, right? Oh, and, sure. and, and, and as you know me, I'm a, I'm a pretty cavalier cowboy kind of guy. But even at the time, I remember thinking like, my only frame of reference for my entire life is the past three years. So, so far, it's going pretty shitty. Right? Like yep. So far, it's gone pretty apocalyptic pretty quickly. My friends are still, yep. you know, looking to graduate college and I'm figuring out how I'm going to be in bankruptcy for the rest of my life, right? <laughs> the, the, things weren't headed off on yep. a really positive path. But what I found was, what I found was that if I, if I were to stop and I were to say, okay, what's really going to happen when I shut this thing down? So I was basically walking through and planning for failure, right? Yep. I said, number one, I don't have to think about this anymore. Once it's done, it's done. Once this thing shut down, yeah. I never have to have this conversation with myself ever again, which by exactly the way, right. kind of looking forward to it, right? You know, I'll get some crappy job, but I'll have money again. You know, instead of just uh, racking up more debt, I'll actually be able to go to the movies or do whatever it is that I wanted to do at the time. You know, imagine that, right? And the, the, the part of it was like little things like, I'll have food. I'll have a place to live. It's not like that's not going to happen. It's not like I'm literally going to be, you know, on the side of the street with no idea how to how to pay for <laughs> right. food, right? And, it's, exactly. and so I think once I unpacked that and realized that even if everything goes to shit, I'm still going to be in a place where I'm functional. It's not going to be ideal and I'm going to regret some things, but the most important thing, I won't have this problem in front of me anymore. That yeah. will go away. And, and that was Clear a huge relief to me. Yep. All right. So in, in, you know, method number two, don't believe the hype. Uh, this one resonated really strongly with me because it took me a long time to get over the idea that I needed to present a particular face. Right? Sure. I needed to, you know, I needed to be the Instagram version of myself where everything was filtered and everything was, you know, nice, the right contrast, so, but well right. lit, you know, and, and the reality is that's, that's not true. And, and I think that in our modern era, it's far easier to fall into that trap because of the amount of filtered bullshit that we're fed every day, right? We're getting the best versions of everybody's lives via Facebook, Instagram, the news, whatever. And, you know, it's, it's like, we've talked about this before, but the overnight success, right? The overnight success right. of a startup. Uh, yeah, the overnight success was uh, 15 years of anxiety leading up to that moment where then they became an overnight success. So, you know, I think that we're, we're presented with so much of this and unless you've been on the other side of it and you really do know, or, or you happen to have background in the stories, if you just take them at face value, you'd have a really shitty bar to compare yourself to, right? By contrast, it would seem like, you know, I have all these flaws. I'm worrying about all this stuff. I'm not perfect. You know, the business isn't going as fast as it could. I'm definitely not an overnight success. And you start to, you know, you start to introduce all of these fallacies as facts inside your own anxiety storm. And right. I think it just drives us further and further in the wrong direction. You know, it, it's so sad to me too, because in an age of information sharing, were we honest in what we shared, it would abate 50% or more of the problem around anxiety. I mean, a big part of it is just thinking, I'm the only one that's going through this. I'm a failure, right? Or right. I'm the only one that's going through this. You know, wh why has everybody else figured this out? Am I just too dumb to do this? What's the problem? And so it, it really, it's, it's ironic that in a, you know, in an environment where we have the ability to open up and be honest, 
that what we choose to do instead is to publicize some you know, strangely filtered version of ourselves and that we're consuming a strangely filtered version of almost everything that we consume. You know, along those lines, going through your Facebook feed is almost an exercise in anxiety, right? And I almost don't <laughs> care who you are. And here's, here, here's yeah. the funniest thing, right? If I would have looked at Will from 25 years ago when I was first starting and I would have looked at the Facebook feed and I saw all these other people that are doing well and I, I would have thought, man, if I could just do as well as they were doing, I wouldn't have anxiety anymore. Dude, like I'm 44 years old, right? I've built multi-million dollar companies, had more success than I ever thought I would. And I still have an exercise in anxiety every time I go through the Facebook feed. And here's the fucked up part. Like I'm looking at people who like aren't even doing as well or doing as, as amazing things. And it still gives right. me anxiety, yep. which is to say there was no way off that treadmill. No matter how well I did, I was still going to feel the same way. Yeah. It was the exercise of comparison that blew me up. Not what the actual comparison was. Yeah. Right? No, just, just the act of going through and doing the comparison is anxiety driving. Yeah. And, and, and it's brutal. And so when that happened, I moved on to method number three, which was focusing on action. Right. Yeah. Every time that my anxiety started to bubble and it was a lot. Right. And I say it was because, Ryan, it's not anymore. And I'll talk a little bit later about why it's not anymore. And some of that are these methods and there's some other things that I've been able to tackle. But when it used to bubble up, and that would be about every three to four hours, right? <laughs> right. Go into this, this high intensity kind of uh, mode where I, where I was feeling anxious and I needed to uh, burn off some steam, so to speak. I'm just Googling Old action. Faithful right now. I think you guys may be on exactly the same schedule for boiling over. <laughs> Yeah, except I'm blowing them more often. It's crazy. What I learned to do, though, this was so helpful. I kept a list of all the things that I needed to get done that were very action-oriented things. And a lot of times, it, things I, would, I didn't necessarily have time for right now. Yep. But as soon as I could tell that feeling was coming up, that kind of, oh, shit, I'm about to have this anxious moment, the first thing is I did is I went to my task list and I just started ripping off tasks, right? Yep. I just put my focus on anything that I could get done quickly, Right. And it turns out, kind of a little known fact, all of that bound up energy can actually be used for good, right? Yeah. And I found during those moments of anxiety, I would start doing some of my most productive work, right? Sure. Uh, I would write articles. I would do product development. I would do so many things that actually took all of that energy and put it into something useful versus something shitty, which was me hopping on the internet and finding 20 more things that would stress me out, <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> Right. And yeah, and because it becomes an endless cycle. Move. If you yeah. don't start to catalog them, they just stay worries. I, I've had this discussion with a lot of people after having kind of come across a, a similar method for myself, whereby, you know, if you just keep worrying, worrying in itself doesn't do anything. I said, you know, well, I've, I've just been worried about this for like two weeks. Right. And my question was always like, well, what the fuck have you been doing for two weeks? Like you could have solved this in, in like a day if you just applied right. the same level of activity to, to, to actually solving the problem. And so I think that a big part of it's cataloging it and, and, you know, then setting a plan in action. And sometimes you don't even have to go through with it. For me, even knowing that, yeah, okay, there's a problem. I'm worried about this thing. I'm typically worried because I don't know what the point of resolution will be. Right. And so simply by cataloging it and then determining what at least one or two methods or points for resolution would be, the anxiety goes away. The problem may still be there, but I'm no longer worried about it. And I know what I have to do when I decide that it's enough of a problem to clear it off my plate. Um, right. But, you know, to your to your point around, you know, driving, using this energy to drive, anxiety is just it, it's another heightened state of awareness. And, and there have definitely been times where my anxiety drove like almost manic level thinking. Um, but some good stuff has come out of that as long as you harness it, right? Put some rails around it, channel it into taking action. I think that it, it's, it's a critical step. And I think that it's one where once you learn how to do it, it changes everything. Because what used to happen to me was that energy would, would just increase and increase. The pace of thinking would increase and increase and increase. But it would just continue to spiral down. And the minute I stopped worrying about one thing, my brain would automatically go into the archives of shit I need to worry about and grab another one and then another right. one and right. another one until it just spiraled out of control. And so, yeah, being able to just get that action focus has, has a huge, huge impact. And I think that, yeah. you know, 
a big part of it. And this, this walks us right into method four, which is take the long view, right? Not all of this stuff has to happen right now. None of these right. things are, are, are usually as, as critical or as urgent as we think. Um, and, you know, I, I imagine that that's part of, of what has, has led to you being able to be a bit more zen about this stuff and say, hey, you know, it's okay. Well, and look, there, there's, I've got the benefit now of experience, right? You know, I've got 25 years of building nine companies, and I've seen more stuff firsthand than I can possibly fathom. Uh, when I was young, I didn't have that. When it was my first company, I didn't have that. I, I didn't understand the difference between this is present, so this is the biggest, most important issue ever, and this is one of about a thousand more issues that are going to come around, right? Yep. As an example, when I was first starting in my career, every single time we ran into the smallest issue, it could be a personnel issue, it could be a customer issue, it could be really anything, it was an apocalyptic, career-ending, life-ending moment, right? And if I, didn't, right. if I didn't solve that issue today, there would be no, no next episode of my comic, right? Like that so was a... Point the cannons down, destroyed. we're blowing the bottom out of the boat. It's all... Exactly, right? Yeah. Now, later on in my career, what I started to learn was it's nothing but those moments, right? And one, honestly, ain't that more important than the next, right? I, I never forget there's this, um, there's this great uh, scene at the, the opening of Saving Private Ryan where... All of the guys are, you know, um, running, storming the beach. And most of them, you know, they've never fired a rifle, so to speak. And they're terrified, right? And then you just see like this grisly kind of old sergeant who's just seen it all before. Yep. Just kind of like merrily walking up the beach. Because he's just like, he's been to this show so many times. He's like, I'm going to either get shot or I'm not. <laughs> there's there's not much I'm going to do about it. I, and, I like this analogy, but isn't he the one that then gets blown to smithereens about eight seconds later? You know, you're really trying to dig into a lot of details here <laughs> that aren't important to this story. <laughs> uh. <laughs> um, but listen, the the second, third, fifth, ninth time around, all of a sudden I started to realize that every one of these problems are big in the near term and meaningless in the long term. Yeah. Right, meaningless. Not to say that 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 there's no um, value to the problems. I, I don't ever ever want to kind of like um, take value out of things. I'm talking about they they aren't worth firing all of your anxiety bullets over. Right. Correct. You know, you you have a, a, an employee situation that's really difficult to deal with. Cool. Guess what? You're going to have 900 more of those. Yes. Right. So if every single time that that the situation comes up, you go full atomic and and use all your anxiety juice on that. Yep. It's it's only going to get worse every single yeah. time. And then that makes your ability to deal with the next issue and the next issue that much more diminished, which increases your anxiety that much more. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a horrible catch-22. When I talk to my wife about it, I come home and I you know, unpack my day with her and, and we talk about all the things that happen. And she's often mortified, right? <laughs> she's like, how the <laughs> hell could you let that happen, right? And I always say the same thing. I said, it's this simple. I have a hundred more of those problems to deal with. They just haven't shown up yet today. Yep. Right. Like I just can't get that excited about this one problem because I've got a hundred more to go. Right. I don't know what they are yet. I just know that they're all going to be coming. Right. And so this came this came with experience. So I don't think I could have done this when I was younger, even if somebody had explained it to me. But once I kind of zoomed out and I tried to take a greater long view that my career isn't just what's going to happen by tomorrow. My career is what's going to happen over the next 10, 20, 30 years. Yep. And today is one tiny pebble in that journey. All of a sudden, man, I got real zen. Right, I started to look at it and said, I care about problems, but I don't, I don't create this ball of anxiety about every single one like it's a life or death moment because it just yeah. never is. It isn't. And, and the reality is that once you can start to take that long view, you have the ability to, to deal with the problems better, right? Like at the end of the day, being worried, being stressed out and, and you know, being anxious doesn't help you to solve any of the problems. Right? right. And it, it compounds. So, you know, at the point where you have faced enough of these things uh, that you know that like they're not all life and death. Yeah, they're all important. And, you know, being able to to take that proper long view should help. Right. And right. mileage will vary. Right. But it should help you to to actually solve those problems better uh, by not it, letting them bubble up and, and get out of control. Well, sticking with the bubble up. Right. Like a lot of people will say. Yeah, some of these techniques, though, aren't really allowing you to deal with the anxiety per se. They're allowing you to compact it and pack it away just like that got you into trouble the first time and shift your focus, right? So you're really shifting focus. You're not dealing with it head on. And, and I think it's important to state that when we're talking about coming up with techniques to deal with it, 
it's not the same as coming up with techniques to ignore it. It's looking for techniques to not make it worse, to not exacerbate it, right? Sure. Because I think you can poke the bear quite a bit when it comes to anxiety. <laughs> yes, you can. Uh, I can I can tell you what that looks like, right? It's loading you into the back of a car. You poke yeah, the bear. Exactly, the bear right? And it, back. It, 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 and it kind of blows you up. And so over the years, a couple of things that I've learned in, in talking to friends, uh, I get a lot of people dealing with this, and everyone's got different levels of how they deal with it. Once I, once I uncovered the fact that... Uh, that I had anxiety. It turned out I had, no surprise, ADHD and a whole bunch of other uh, issues tied to that. But, you know, I, I went and looked for lots of different types of help, right? And I, I talked to a lot of people about how they were combating it. Uh, a lot of people uh, medicate for it, you know, take prescription meds for it. Yeah. Um, and so, and, and that's one way to do it. I ended up finding a solution that was a, um, a supplement that it was actually a recommendation from a guy named Ray Kurzweil, who's, uh, you know, uh, led MIT's tech group. I can't remember which one it was a while back, but is also on a mission to live forever. And so Ray takes yes. like 250 pills a day and everything else like that. But he turned me on to one of his uh, cocktails, if you will. It was a product called 5-HTP, which is, a, again, a supplement that was basically a, a mood enhancer. Uh, and now it's become super popular among founders. What a shock. And another one, which is DHEA, which is more of a, um, a hormone balancer. And yep. here's what was really interesting about it. On a, on a fluke, I basically took him up on this. Uh, this is maybe three, three and a half years ago. And I ended up taking the two products, like one a day. And for the first few weeks, nothing changed. I didn't think much of it, right? And then, Ryan, I remember you and, and Elliot and the rest of the team definitely saw this because you had to deal with my, my emotions every day. Just all of a sudden, one day, the typical issue that would normally come up that would normally freak me out that would normally having me e email yep. or slack or text everybody just didn't bother me it's not that it didn't register it wasn't that i no. didn't care it just didn't bother me right it's and that's huge such difference. an important point right it's these things will still occur you can't control whether the problems bubble up i think a lot of founders fall into that trap too where they're like i just have to be better at preventing this if i was doing a better job these things wouldn't have happened bullshit they will it's about how you react to them, right? And that's the only thing that you really get to choose is right. how do I feel about these things? And I think that to some degree, we feel like our feelings are what they are and, and we're just going to feel like something's going to happen. I'm going to react. That's my personality. That's what it is. But that's not true, right? And you found that, you know, it's probably some sort of a chemical imbalance, a uh, deficiency in a nutrient of some sort. So supplementation worked for you. I started meditating. And if you had told me 20 years ago as, as a young founder that I would start meditating someday, I'd be like, Oh, cool. Will I also be wearing Birkenstocks and, and cut off jean <laughs> shorts and smoking enough wheat? Right. So no, I, I never would have thought that. And I remember the first, I, so I've, I've started to meditate twice. I've tried, I had to do this. I had to go through the process twice. The first time it actually made my anxiety worse because it turned out when I sit alone by myself with my eyes closed for 20 minutes, I find plenty of time to be anxious right? Literally, you're focusing and on being I, anxious at that point. I was just sitting there and yeah, I was like, <laughs> let me, so I almost, yeah, I, I think I almost started hovering above the ground just from the, the anxious vibrations. But so the first time it was, it was a failed effort, right? I, I sort of started to feel like, okay, this, is, this seems to be doing something for me, but eventually I just gave up because I just felt like I was more anxious. And I wish I could put my finger on what the difference was the second time around. I used a different method uh, so I, I tried two different products. I, I used Headspace and I really liked the Headspace product. I really did. Right. I love the product. But in the end, I didn't get to where I wanted to be with that. And, and then I switched over to another one called Waking Up uh, by Sam Harris. And I really enjoyed it. Uh, the rhythm worked a little better for me. I think it may have been life changes, a lot of stuff. But ultimately, I got to the point where I was able to get to just a very calm place. And even better than that now, as these things that come up that might start to stress me out, I'm able to recreate that at almost any moment in the day. And, you know, That's it's amazing. one of those things where if somebody had told me that, I'd be like, okay, yeah, hippy dippy bullshit, whatever. Now that I'm there, I get it, right? I understand it. And for me, I think that's been the, the biggest turn was just kind of being able to give myself space and, and a little bit of freedom to not feel stressed out and to not feel anxious. And, you know, along those lines, though, Ryan, what also happened during that time for you, for me, for, for the rest of our team is, and I think this might have been the single greatest change in kind of in, in, the, in the trajectory of our um, recovery, 
was we were open with each other about it, right? Oof. See, I thought you were going to say me leaving the physical office. Yeah, no, that, that's actually what it was. <laughs> we were open by the fact that you needed to get the hell out of the office. No. But like, no, we were, it, it got really interesting because it all of a sudden became kind of a circle of trust, right? Yeah. Where someone could raise their hand and say, hey, dude, I'm, my anxiety is off the charts right now. And everyone else understood what that meant and yeah. was down to help. Now take yes. that out of the equation where you say, hey, I've got a horrible anxiety, but instead you're terrified of telling your coworkers because you think that's going to come off as weakness or you know, you're know you not focused on your job or anything that's not positive, right? Right. Um, I, as I tend to do, externalized the hell out of it, right? I told everybody that, hey, this is something I'm dealing with, I'm wrestling with. If all of a sudden I'm coming at you out of the blue, like I tend to do, uh, or used to, not quite as much anymore, hold me up and say, hey, man, is yeah. this, you know, this sounds like, like, like a, a problem you were dealing with before. I told you guys about it. I told my wife about it. I told my friends about it. And what do you know? All of us started to be able to raise our hands saying, yeah, you know, it's actually a problem for me right now, too. And I thought that was the most helpful thing in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Getting it out in the open, knowing that you're not the only one going through it. And there's so many, so many things in life that are, that are true in the same way. But I think in terms of anxiety, it's so important because anxiety is such a self fed beast and anxiety begets anxiety. And so I think that cutting it off in that way is, is really important. Uh, and the reality is think, that, Oh, sorry. Oh, oh, sorry. I was going to say, I also think that it helped us dramatically as an organization because when the leadership can be very open about some of the things that they're dealing with, it kind of gives everybody else permission and right in agency yes. to be able to say, it's funny you should say that because I'm actually dealing with it too. Like I thought, I didn't think the CEO would deal with it, right? Oh, yeah. he's dealing with it too? Well, hey, uh, I'm dealing with this. That's a and great point. Over the great years, point. I've been able to have very frank conversations with our team all across the, the, the organization about depression, about anxiety, about like deep-seated personal issues that folks are dealing with, stuff that would have probably never surfaced before. But I think we created an environment where people were willing to open up about these things and because they were willing to open up, we could talk through them. It became a thousand times more productive, but more importantly, a hell of a lot happier. See, there you go. Method number five, have a clinically relevant anxiety event that acts as an icebreaker <laughs> so that it can permeate your entire company culture. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, well, hey, it worked, you know, so yeah, it is definitely. It did. <laughs> it's it did. Number but look, five, there it is. We're all going to deal with this for the rest of our lives, right? We We're, it, 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 it's not going to stop. And so I think that the, um, the important points to take away from today are there are ways of dealing with it. There are ways to get through it and that, you know, it's not going to go away. So learn, learn to live with it and, and learn to find your own ways of dealing with it and find a way to harness this as a superpower. I agree. I agree. And I, th I think well, like to your point, Ryan, we all have it. Uh, it's a scale of one to 10. Sometimes it's at 12, but it's never at zero, right? And I think we just all need to figure out how to get our volume on it turned down as much as possible. And I think that's the key toward dealing with it and, and really trying to make it a part of our lives that we can not only manage with, but flourish with. That's a wrap for this episode of the Startup Therapy Podcast. This is Ryan Rutan on behalf of my partner, Will Schroeder, and all the Startups.com family thanking you for joining us. And we hope you'll continue to join us. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and comment on iTunes or wherever you love to listen to Startup Therapy. You can find all of our episodes at startups.com slash podcast. If you're looking for more amazing resources to launch or grow your startup, be sure to head to startups.com and check out Startups Unlimited. It's everything we have to offer from our online university to our amazing community of experts and founders, and even all the tools we've built like BizPlan, Fundable, and LaunchRock. It's everything a founder needs. Visit startups.com slash begin. That's startups.com slash B-E-G-I-N. You'll thank me later.